Hi, I'm Alan Saunders, here with the Philosopher's Zone and a tribute to Michael Dummett, one of the greatest English philosophers of the 20th century, who died late in December at the age of 86. He was a logician and a metaphysician, and also, incidentally, an expert on tarot cards, which he insisted were for playing games with, not for divination. His first major work, the enormous Frege, Philosophy of Language, published in 1973, was a groundbreaking study of Gottlob Frege, the late 19th and early 20th century German mathematician and logician. And here he is, talking about Frege. Fundamentally, he's the founder of what is called analytic philosophy. He was the first to attempt a systematic analysis of language and thereby of thought that has made him the founder of a whole school of philosophy. He died in 1925, which was the year in which I was born. <laughs> he was a devoted philosopher who didn't have much credit in his own country, which was Germany, and I think that came to depress him a good deal. He had admirers elsewhere, in particular Bertrand Russell. He did study mathematics in his early years, but he was primarily a philosopher. His ambition was to put mathematics on an absolutely firm foundation. He became the first real philosopher to attempt a systematic analysis of language, how it worked, and of the thoughts that were expressed in it. I'm afraid he did, to some extent, have racist views, anti-Semitic views. I was very, very upset when I first discovered this fact by reading some of the papers that were preserved at the University of Münster because I'd always idealized Frege as a perfectly rational man. And then when he expressed such views, I realized he wasn't in every respect a perfectly rational man. That upset me a very great deal. His philosophy ought to have kept him from holding such views, but it didn't. In sharp contrast to Frege, Dummett was a determined and public opponent of racism. When he was knighted, it was for services to philosophy and to racial justice. He was also, unusually for a British philosopher, a practicing Roman Catholic, having been received into the church at the age of 19. To talk about Dummett, we're joined now by Graham Priest, Professor of Philosophy at the University of Melbourne. Graham, welcome back to the Philosopher's Zone. Thank you, Alan. Nice to be here. Dummett's probably not widely known to the general public. Would it be fair to describe him as a philosopher's philosopher? It's true that he's probably not widely known to the general public. That's because he tended to work in fairly esoteric parts of philosophy, like philosophy of logic, philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of language. Though these are esoteric, they're absolutely central parts to modern philosophy, but they're not parts which uh, get into the public eye, which tends to be things like ethics and political philosophy and so on. What was your relationship with him? Well, I met him only a few times. Probably the most significant time for me was when he was one of the examiners for my doctorate. And my doctorate was on mathematical logic and the philosophy of mathematics. And I wanted a philosopher who worked in those areas to examine it. And Dummett by then was already eminent. This was 1974. And very happily he agreed to do so. And you said to him that your thesis fell down the crack between mathematics and philosophy. And he replied to you that I inhabit the crack. Yes, he did. From... An early time, Michael had an interest in the philosophy of mathematics, and to be a good philosopher of mathematics, you have to be a good philosopher, of course, but you also have to be a tolerable mathematician. 
So he worked in both those areas, as did I at the time. Now, the great philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein was important to Dummett, and in particular, Wittgenstein's idea that meaning is use. Tell us about that. It might make sense to backtrack a little in the story. Can we talk about intuitionism first? OK, there's a distinction in mathematics between Platonism and intuitionism. So what's going on there? This is, in the first instance, a view about what sorts of things mathematical objects are. And Platonists hold them to be abstract objects of some kind, that is, objects outside the realm of causation and space and time. Many philosophers find this view rather crazy, and... At the beginning of the 20th century, there was a Dutch mathematician, Brouwer, who said, this cannot possibly be right. Mathematical objects must be simply mental constructions, whatever exactly those are. And this seemingly harmless observation has quite profound consequences for how you do mathematics, what sort of inferences you regard as valid. And it gives rise to a kind of logic called intuitionist logic, which is different from standard mathematical logic. For a long time, intuitionism was a fairly esoteric doctrine in the philosophy of mathematics, and it wasn't generally well received. However, what Michael did around the 1970s was to take this view and to turn it into a very general view about the nature of language, which applied not just to mathematical language, but all kinds of language. And that's the thing for which I think he's principally famous. Now, at this point, we can probably get back to Wittgenstein because the later Wittgenstein held that the meaning of things, the meaning of words, must be encapsulated in their use. Michael accepted that view. So he thought that when you give an account of meaning, then it has to be one such that it answers to and only answers to, in the end, the way that people use language. And... He argued that a consequence of this view was precisely that the sort of logic that you need in general, not just about mathematics, was intuitionist logic. And as I say, that's the view for which he became most famous in his later years. How does it work, intuitionist logic? You're saying what? That numbers don't exist in an abstract realm. Numbers are what we think they are and they're how we use the numbers. There's no more to mathematics than the way we use mathematical language. And if you're a Platonist, there's certainly more, because there's the reference we make to all these strange abstract objects. Now, if you don't subscribe to that view, and you subscribe to the view that the language of mathematics, and in fact of anything else, must answer to the use we make of them, then you cannot explain the way that language works by reference to this domain of objects. It's got to be, in a sense, internal to the practice of using language. And in mathematics, that's proof. In language in general, it's something like verification. So Dummett became a verificationist something like 30 or 40 years after verificationism of the logical positivist kind had gone out of popularity. We should explain verificationism of the logical positivist kind. Basically, the logical positivists were saying that a term had meaning only if you knew the way in which it could be verified. So a statement like, I don't know, there's a table laid for tea on the dark side of the moon... That had meaning because you know how you could verify it. You'd go to the dark side of the moon and look for the table. But a statement like, there is a God, you don't know how you'd verify that, so it didn't have any meaning. That's right, and the positivists got themselves into a morass by trying to understand what verification was. It was a morass that Dummett never really entered into because his paradigm case was always mathematics. And in mathematics, verification is relatively clear because the canons of mathematical proof are relatively well defined. Now, we've already mentioned Gottlob Frege. Frege's philosophy of language was enormously important to Dummett, wasn't it? 
Yes, it was. And as you said, it's really dumb its book on Frege's philosophy of language that establishes reputation. There's a second book, which Dominic published later, called Frege's Philosophy of Mathematics, which is not as long. The first book on Frege is about the size of the Sydney telephone book, if, uh, if Sydney still has telephone books. So it, it's, it's enormous. Frege had an enormous influence on philosophy and logic, but his influence, especially in English-speaking countries, was transmitted by Russell and Wittgenstein, so people didn't know much about Frege, and this changed somewhat in the 60s where people started to do their history property, and Frege became recognised for what he was. And Dummett's study of him was really the first study of Frege as a philosopher. It brought Frege to general prominence in English-speaking philosophy in spades. And what did he get as a philosopher? What did he get from Frege? Well, Frege was probably the first person in the contemporary period that is the last 120 years, I guess, to articulate a worked-out philosophy of language. Frege Philosophy of Language, Dummett's book, is an explanation and analysis, a very cute and knowledgeable explanation and analysis. Frege was a Platonist, though, so in the last instance, Frege did believe in these objects which are outside the causal spatio-temporal realm. And it was, I think, when Dummett wrote this book that he started to rebel against this aspect of Frege precisely because of the influence of the later Wittgenstein. After his study of Frege's philosophy of language, what notion of meaning did Dummett emerge with? Dummett had to give an account of language according to which, in some sense, it answered to the use we make of language. And at least as far as proof goes, the use we make of certain words in logic, for example, seem to be encapsulated by the rules of proof which govern them. For example, take a very simple construction like the conditional, if A, then B. Now, many people think that that's governed by a couple of rules, one says that if you assume A and deduce B, then that gives you a proof of if A then B. And one says if you assume A and if A then B, you got a proof of B. So Dummett thought that those two rules actually characterise the meaning of the conditional. And the story generalises to other things which we won't go into. But you can't use an arbitrary set of rules to characterise meaning because all hell breaks loose. So Dummett argued that the rules involved must satisfy certain conditions. He had a certain notion of harmony, nothing to do with music, OK? It has to do with the relationship between the various rules. And this relationship of harmony must hold if the rules are to work as they should. And Dummett argued that once you get the appropriate constraints of harmony right, then what falls out is intuitionistic logic, not the logic of Frege. On ABC Radio National, you're with The Philosopher's Zone, and I'm talking to Graham Priest from the University of Melbourne about the great English philosopher Michael Dummett, who died late last year. Graham, Dummett distinguished between realism and anti-realism. He came down on the anti-realist side. What does that mean? Well, it's another way of describing what we've been talking about. In the philosophy of mathematics, a realist is a person who believes in the existence of these abstract objects like numbers, one, two, three, and an anti-realist is someone who rejects that. And there are various kinds of anti-realism, but intuitionism is a very significant one. For the intuitionist, mathematical objects are not out there independent of people. They're in some sense human construction. So this is some kind of idealism. All right, now... When Dummett extended this view about mathematics to language in general, he had to adopt an anti-realist position about objects in general. So he has a number of interesting papers, for example, where he talks about the future and the past and dispositions and all kinds of things. He had to give an analysis of these in anti-realist terms. So, for example, most of us are realists about the past in some sense. We think that, you know, the past actually happened and it's out there and it's fixed. So the past is now independent of any of our cognitive processes. This is a realist view. It's not an anti-realist view. Dummett's view was rather different. And it, essentially, he has to tell a story about the status, the ontological status of the past in terms of our access to it, the things which we can verify in the end. <laughs> 
So what are statements about the past? What do they amount to? Are they basically statements about the present evidence that we have of what happened in the past? Not exactly. Certainly the evidence is relevant and one form of evidence can be memory. It's a reasonably generous notion of evidence. But it's not so much that the statements about the past mean things about the evidence. Rather, it is the evidence we have provides the procedures we have for verifying past tense statements, which are in part constitutive of the meaning of past tense statements. It's not that past tense statements mean something about our evidence. Rather, it's the evidence we have which provides a verification, which grounds the meaning. Is that sort of distinction clear? It's a rather <laughs> subtle one, I guess, for the ABC listeners. Yeah, well, perhaps you might enlarge a bit on it, because it's not absolutely clear. I mean, I think that if Julius Caesar crossed the Rubicon in whenever BC, if I were there, I would have seen it happening. And therefore, it did happen. But we don't have any evidence of it now, apart from what we're told. And we don't even know where the Rubicon was. So what's the evidence that I'm going on here? Yeah, okay. So the misses the morass that Dummett never really got into, which is, you know, way parted company from the positivists. I don't think he ever spelt out a systematic account of what empirical verification counts for. In the particular case you're talking about, I think he'd have been happy to say that we do have evidence for the facts about Caesar, at least things like the historical annals that we have, the records that have been passed down to us, etc., etc. But the case will be quite different with whether Caesar had a partridge for his breakfast on the day of his death. That's something on which the annals of history are entirely silent, as far as I, I know. So Dummett would have to say that that particular claim about the past is neither true nor false, uh, simply because we have no way of verifying that he did or that he didn't. Well, that's curious. It's neither true nor false. You see, I want to say that the statement Caesar had a partridge for breakfast on the day of his death, well, either he did or he didn't. So if I say that, either I'm right or I'm wrong. Now, there might not be any way of knowing whether I'm right or wrong, but nonetheless, I am either right or wrong. Yeah, this is something which intuitionists and Dummett contested vigorously. What you're appealing to often gets called the principle of excluded middle. Something's either true or it's false, and that's it, you only got those choices. And that's a principle that fails significantly in intuitionist logic. It's one of the things which really distinguishes intuitionistic logic from the logic of Frege. And if you think that truth, whatever that means in these cases, it just is verifiability, then if we can verify neither the statement about Caesar and his breakfast nor its negation, then neither of those is true. In other words, the claim about his breakfast is neither true nor false. Now... Dummett wanted to justify logical laws. How did he go about that? And how can you justify a logical law without using logic? OK, this takes us back, in fact, to what I was talking about, about meaning. In logic, the things which hold are often reckoned to hold in virtue of the way that certain logical particles mean, like the conditional if-then negation is not the case that, and so on. So if you want to justify the principles of logic, you have to show how those fall out of the meanings which get attributed to those particles, like the conditional if-them. And as I said a little bit earlier, Dummett held that the rules which govern the way we prove things using if-then and, and similar particles would be constitutive of the meaning. So having got the rules of proof of a certain kind which satisfy harmony, then this specifies the use and therefore the meaning of those terms and the things which are true in logic are the things which follow in virtue of those meanings. What for Dummett was the distinction between what he called semantic theory and meaning theory? It's something like this. In modern logic, there are two kinds of techniques which are used to talk about what follows from what in logic. 
One is the rules of proof, and we've already talked about those. The other is something called semantics. And semantics means a way of talking about the meaning of things which transcend the mere rules of proof. So we might, for example, talk about the denotations of certain objects, that, that is, that the, the objects that words refer to. And in the case of mathematics, if you're a realist, this will be these abstract objects. So the denotation of an object is basically what you can point to. Yeah, if it's the kind of thing you can point to. Of course, if the denotation of an object is the number three, you can't point to it, except in some kind of mental pointing. But Dummett was clear that in the last instance, an account of meaning had to answer to rules of proof and that any account of meaning, reference, had to answer in the last instance to these. So he was completely out of sympathy with the way that half the techniques of contemporary logic get deployed. And meaning theory is what? OK, it's ambiguous. One thing it can mean is a general second-order analysis of how it is that words mean, how it is that language means, how you go about realising this project and telling the story and executing it, which is what Michael worked on most of the time. It can also mean the account of meaning you give of a particular language, so that's a first-order project, the kind of thing that maybe linguists get up to. But the second-order investigation of the general constraints on what a theory of meaning must look like. Any first-order theory of meaning must answer to those general constraints. Finally, Graham Priest, how important a figure do you think Dummett was? This is very hard to say. How important people are usually gets told only in retrospect, and there's none of us who can predict what's going to happen in the future. So how significant a philosopher Dummett will eventually be seen as I think all bets are off, as they are with most contemporary philosophers. However, in terms of his effect on 20th century philosophy, that's now well established. After his work on Frege, with his work on intuitionism and the philosophy of language, he was undoubtedly, I think, the most influential philosopher in Britain in the second part of the 20th century. I mean, there are other people who are perhaps more influential in ethics, but if you restrict it to the sort of central areas I mentioned of philosophy of language, metaphysics and so on, I think it's certainly true that Dummett was the most influential philosopher. Wittgenstein's influence was waning by the 60s, 70s, and after that, Dummett, I think, uh, became the most significant philosopher. Well, that's pretty significant. <laughs> Graham Priest, thank you very much for being with us today. A pleasure. <laughs>